All right, so we're getting started. I'm um, sorry, I had to get that recording going because we do, when we do these type of Sunday schools, we do record them and put them on the YouTube. So if you miss it, you can catch those. Although um, coming in the new year, we're gonna start doing a video um, studies, a few different ones from um, Ligonier. Um, we're gonna begin the year with From Dust to Ashes, which is basically an overview um, study. Um, particularly, we're gonna be leaning in um, from the overview of the Old Testament going into next year. Um, and really what it does is you think it takes just a very high level, um, like in, in one week covering, you know, whole books of the Bible, but just to get a sense of what's the overarching story arc, particularly of the Old Testament, because there's so much crucial foundations to our faith that are laid out in the Old Testament. And often um, they just all kind of blur together, especially because our Bibles and our Old Testament is not laid out in chronological fashion. Um, there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of books where things are happening at the same time. So people can tend to just get very lost on what the story is as it pertains to the Old Testament. Um, so we're excited to go through that. So I'm not going to begin up here teaching in the new year for a while for Sunday school, although we will have discussion every week um, for the videos we're going over for that. So just to give you an idea of where we're going, let me pray and then we'll jump into this morning's lesson. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that you have allowed us to come and to worship you um, this Lord's Day. We thank you so much for just your grace of your hand upon this past um, year and the, the worship that we've had as this being the last Sunday of this year that we're well, it's not. We have one more Sunday, but the last um, Sunday um, of this year where we're having Sunday school. Um, Lord, we just thank you for your faithfulness of the past year, all that you've taught us from your word. Um, God, you've just sown so much um, good news into us um, in this time we've gathered for Sunday school. And we just thank you for that. Um, and God, just pray that your hand of blessing would be on our Sunday school classes that we're going over next year, um, and that you would be leading us and guiding us and teaching us during that, that time. And God, I just pray as we cover this last week of what does the Bible say about um, answering these various questions people have submitted, um, that you just give us grace um, to understand these things, help us to apply them. Um, and Lord, particularly in our context, I pray that this one would be helpful and beneficial to think about the military, think about serving um, the country in that way from a biblical perspective, what does the Bible teach on these things? Um, and Lord, I pray that we would be governed according to your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So as we've been going through this series, um, what the, does the Bible say about each week? We're seeking to answer a different question um, that people have submitted um, from the point of view of the scriptures. What does the Bible teach on this? And in most churches, in most places, this is probably one of those questions that would just never come up and would never need to be asked or answered. Um, but particularly here in Junction City, this is an incredibly relevant um, question as it pertains to what does the Bible say about military ethics and kind of the background of this um, the, the question that was submitted was actually like much longer. It was like a paragraph I always try to boil them down to like one or two words for the sake of a title But basically the, the background to this question was someone asked it because they had encountered a Christian that told them it was unethical um, as a Christian for them to be serving in the military um, that that was wrong that they shouldn't do it um, that the Bible forbids that sort of thing. And they, they, as a soldier, were like, what do I do with that? And so that's kind of the background to this, is someone was questioning whether as a Christian they could even serve in the army. Um, and so that's where we're going with this morning, is to seek to answer that question. What does the Bible actually say about this? And to begin, just kind of as an introduction, this is a historical debate that's certainly not a new one. It's one that's been going on in the church um, for quite a while. If you trace it back um, all the way to the time of the Reformation, there was really this break um, amongst, you say, the Protestants. Um, they were actually, many of them in this tradition wouldn't self-identify as Protestants, but they weren't Catholics. And that is really the Anabaptist um, tradition. So not the Baptist, all right? There's a distinction here. There's Baptist and then there's the Anabaptist. And the Anabaptists were total pacifists. They, they took Jesus's teaching of turning the other cheek to mean um, that we should never engage in any sort of violence um, whatsoever. And fl from this Anabaptist tradition came like the Amish, the Mennonite, um, the Plymouth Brethren, all those kind of flow from this Anabaptist tradition. And it is a completely pacifistic tradition. It says that Christians should never engage in any sort of violence of any sort. Um, God's 
ways are not of this world. Violence is worldly. Um, as Christians, we should have no part of it. All right, so that's been one position in church history and they've been a fairly prevalent um, tradition in that they've gained a lot of ground and steam and a lot of people have heard that. And there's modern iterations of that that aren't necessarily in those streams, um, but teach that same sort of thing. And then there's been the other side that has said um, that there is a just use of violence. There's a just use of self-defense. There is a righteous um, way for Christians to exercise these sorts of things. And that's why that even like our confession of faith gets into some of these matters as it pertains to Christians serving in offices such as civil magistrate and this sorts of things, because there's a biblical usage for this. And we wanted to clarify that. And particularly in the 1600s, this was a raging debate that they felt the need to address. I would say it's probably a less um, prevalent debate now in the church. Uh, but for a time in church history, this was a hotly debated issue. Can Christians engage in any sort of um, violence? And that comes up in the scriptures as well, because we're trying to reconcile often what some would take to be contrasting statements. Jesus does tell us to turn the other cheek, right? He does tell us to love our enemies. Those are real Bible verses that we need to wrestle with. But then we also see in the scriptures that God does instruct particularly governments to enact punishments, all right? So one the, the a easy way to understand this scriptural tension, right, is you could take the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not murder or kill, depending on how that's translated, right? But it says, thou shalt not murder or kill. But then when you get to the application of the Ten Commandments into the civil code, what does it say? Anyone who kills should be put to death, okay? So... What well, you say, wait, so someone's not supposed to kill someone, and if they do kill someone, then, that, then the government should kill them, right? So what, what do we learn from that, right? There is a wrong use of murder or killing someone, but then there's a right usage of that as well, right? Because the righteous way to respond to a murderer on, the, on behalf of the government is to kill that murderer, all right? So the government killing that murderer is obviously not committing sin. They're doing the righteous thing that God has called them to do, all right? So that's the kind of the tension in the scriptures that we see. There is a wrong way to kill someone, and then there's a right way to kill someone. There is wrong ways to use violence, and there's right ways to use violence. So that's just kind of as an introduction into the, how this debate has played out. Christians have wrestled with these things for a long time. So I'm coming out on the very front end of this saying, no, we, we're not in that Anabaptist pacifistic tradition. We do believe there's a right use of violence. There are scriptural commands against certain forms of violence, but not violence as a category altogether. And this, as we think about this, it's helpful to think of this in very basic terms as we think of the story arc of scripture. A military or a army, this sort of thing, would have been completely unnecessary in Eden, right? As, as mankind was at perfect peace with one another, there's no need to have a military. All right, so this sort of violence, this sort of warfare, that would have not been something that was necessary in the beginning. But then if you see in brackets in our handout there, the answer is sort of, okay? Because was there an enemy in the garden? There was, right? The serpent came into the garden. The serpent was seeking to war against God. And would Adam have been justified to use violence against the snake? He would have. In fact, because Jesus is the second and better Adam, and what does Jesus do? He crushes the head of the serpent. If Adam was doing his God-ordained role to protect his wife and to keep um, the law that he'd given him, as this serpent was seeking to deceive them with his mouth, he should have used his heel and crushed that serpent's mouth, stopped his lies, stopped his blasphemies, and ended that whole thing, protecting his wife and the rest of mankind. So there was, even in the garden, there could have been a right usage of warfare in the spiritual battle as Satan was seeking to tempt them. Um, but that's not what happened. There wasn't a war between people, but there was a spiritual war still underway. And from that... Would that be like in the category of him exercising his dominion? Over mm -hmm. his Absolutely. So, so there's no battles, sort of, in the garden in that time, but there was in another sense. But from that point of the fall, 
we see as sin enters into the world that violence is just something that's going to be inevitable. We see that play out in a sinful way between Cain and Abel, right, from the very beginning and their war with each other. Um, certainly that was an unrighteous form of murder um, that happened. But from that flowing, that principle, we see that anyone who sheds innocent blood, so should that man's blood be shed. And that's the tension that we live in ever since the fall, that we live in a broken society that often requires violence to curb violence. If you think of that principle of, of capital punishment, why is it that we execute murders, or we should? We don't necessarily in this society, but that's what God's law teaches would be the just punishment for that crime and that sin. Why do you do that, though? Why is it that the state should execute a murderer? It's to prevent more murders, right? It's actually an, a love for life that you would end certain lives in that case, all right? So it's necessary, but it's only necessary in light of the fall. This is only something that happens because we live in a broken world in which you have to deal with broken things. And could someone read for us um, Joel chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, as we see this necessity in light of the fall? Proclaim this among the nations, prepare for holy war, rouse the warriors, let all men of war advance and attack, beat your plows into swords and your pruning knives into spears, let even the weakly say, I am a warrior. Yep. So here we see this call from God's prophet for the people to take their plows and to turn them into what? Swords, right? And fight, right? God's calling them to fight. He's calling them to warfare. But then in, in this, as we think of the flow of the gospel, is this how it will be forever? Well, not at all. It's a temporary necessity, which will be overcome by the reign of Jesus. One of the great things we talk about this time of year is that what does Jesus come to do? He comes to bring his peace into the world, right? He's the prince of peace. And as Christians, we shouldn't think of warfare being an eternal thing. It's a temporary thing. It's a temporary battle. It's not one which will exist forever. And so I want us to compare that language that we just read about in Joel um, chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, which tells the people to take their plows and to turn them into swords, right? Compare that to what it says in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4, as it pertains to what Jesus will accomplish. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Yeah. So notice it's the exact inverse opposite of what we just read in Joel 3, right? And so where they're told to turn their plows into swords, now they got these swords, what should they turn them into? Plowshares, right? So it's the opposite. This world that's been given over to war because of sin, what is Jesus going to do through his reign? He's going to bring it back to peace, all right? So there's a hope of that flipping around. We see the same language in Micah chapter 4, verse 3. Someone read for that, that for us. And you shall judge between many peoples and shall decide disputes for strong nations far away. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their shears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Absolutely. Yep, that's it. So as we think about a military, and I do think there is a just use for military in a fallen world, we have to understand it's a temporary battle. In the, the warfare that exists here in the world, that warfare ends in peace. We know how the story ends. It ends in King Jesus bringing peace for all his creation. That's something we look forward to. That's something we long for. So as much as we wrestle with these sorts of things, we have to understand this is a temporary um, battle. It's one that we know Jesus will win. We shouldn't think of Christians warring for all eternity. Christians war temporarily until the victory is completed. And we already know it's won. Jesus said it is finished, but he's still working out that victory in time now. So as we think about that from the flow of the gospel, um, I want to cover a few specific points as we think about military ethics. The first is um, the part of the job of the military, we've already talked about this a little bit, is the right to punish civilly, okay? So one of the things we have to see in the scriptures is that the Bible does not justify vigilante justice. 
Okay, it doesn't just simply tell people to take matters into their own hands, um, to be um, the type that see, see bad and we're, we're just gonna handle this ourselves. No, he institutes civil governments in order to help um, regulate these sorts of things. It's not the job of just anyone to engage in these matters, but he does um, institute civil governments in order to punish. And we see that all throughout the Old Testament judicial code. That's exactly what the nation of Israel was called to do as particular sins and crimes were committed. There was punishments that were issued for those crimes and thus they were to carry that out. Well, what's the implication that God is opposed to that sort of thing? No, he's commanding them as a nation to do that. He's doing that for a reason and because he's given the civil magistrate in order to carry out this sort of justice or judgment um, in different civil matters. And we see that same sort of language fleshed out in the New Testament. Um, not, this wasn't only for the nation of Israel. This is also a perpetual thing in God's ordering of the world that he has put rulers in authority. Someone read for us Romans 13, verses 2 through 4. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Yep. So what, what do we here learn about the civil magistrate there? That he bears a sword? He does not do so in vain. He's God's avenger, right? And this is for the good of society. This is how God ordered civil governments to go. That's a natural thing. And when we think about this, sometimes when we say civil magistrate, we think of like the governor, the emperor, the president, right? But under that battle of civil magistrate is also the army, right? Who is actually the one holding the sword? It's those that execute this sort of thing. And thus, as we think biblically about this, we, we should kind of have that broad tent of when, when we even think about armies, police officers, correctional officers, county sheriffs, all those things, they're really all under that banner of civil magistrate. They're those civil authorities that God has put in place in order to carry out these things. We have very, you know, all these different categories for it. In the ancient world, as they're writing, it, that was all the same people, right? The army was the one who went out to battle, is also the ones that handled things in the city. It was all the same people. And so we, we break those up into a lot of different categories. Um, but the Bible just speaks about it really in one category. Read, someone read for us from First Peter as well, chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Yeah. So here we see that word particularly punish. Um, this, this is one of the things we have to understand too is the role of the magistrate as they're executing the sword. It's not to um, reform people or make them feel better about themselves. It's actually to punish them. Uh, we, we don't use that sort of word um, because it doesn't sound nice to us. But what do we even call prisons? We call them penitentiaries, right? What's the idea? We want to make them penitent. That's Re religious language, right, is wanting to make them repentant. It's, that's the root word of that penitence, right? It's, it's we want them to actually, you know, think of themselves a new way and turn from it. The Bible doesn't actually use that sort of language as it talks about the civil magistrate executing these sorts of things. It's God's avenger, right? It's to punish those who do evil. It's to execute the, the judgment that they deserve. And part of what God has in view there is not just that one person, but it's the whole community, right? It's his love for the community that makes him stop the evildoer. Um, if you let an evildoer keep going on doing evil, that's unloving to the rest of the community, right? You might say, well, what, shouldn't we have compassion on that one person? Well, what about compassion for everyone that they're harming as they go about their killing spree? So you think of a murderer, for example, that was killing person after person. The most loving thing you can do is put that person to death. Right, because that's how you love all the people that are put in his harm's way. All right, so civil magistrates or militaries do have a right to punish civilly. And thus, the person who bears that sword, right, say if your job was to execute those murders, 
you should not feel any guilt before God for doing that, right? Because God says that he commands it, that's what should happen to this person. If you happen to be that person whose job it is to execute the murderer, you should feel no guilt before God for that. That's a very justified thing biblically is following what God has commanded, all right? So they do have that jumping, right. I'm kind of jumping forward, but yep. at the end you're gonna talk about too, just doing all things for God's glory. like. You're the executioner and you enjoy killing people. You probably should not have that job. Right. You probably yeah. shouldn't be doing that either. That's not yeah. glorifying to the Lord right. either. Yeah, there's not, if it's to fulfill some sort of bloodlust or right. something, that's yeah. a completely yeah, different thing. Twisted. Right. And, and we should always grieve death. We should never be cold to that, right? Death is, again, a result of the fall. Right. Um, but there's a righteous time to employ that. All right, so they do have the right to punish civilly, but we also see that nations and people have a right to personal defense as well. That's, a, that's another application of this use of, of violence. And we see that personally played out. Um, someone read for us in Exodus chapter 22, verses two through three. If a thief is found breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there shall be no blood guilt for him. But if the sun has risen on him, there shall be blood guilt for him. He shall surely pay. If he has nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. If the stolen beast is found alive in his possession, whether it is an ox or a donkey or a sheep, he shall pay double. Yep. So in this, we, we see in the law of God, as it's fleshing out some different scenarios here, and that if someone breaks into the house in the middle of the night and you end up killing that person, then you are not guilty of murder, it says. But... If that thief breaks into the house during the day and you murder them, you would be guilty of murder. Now, what's going on there? Why is it at nighttime it's okay and at daytime it's not okay? Because at nighttime, you have no ability to assess the threat or what's happening, right? It's just pure self-defense in that moment. It's saying in that point, you are justified. During the day, if it's a thief coming in just to steal something, well, theft is not a worthy punishment for killing them, right? So. The, what's the principle in the Old Testament? It's an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, right? There's the principle of the righteous response. Well, stuff is not worth a human life. A thief um, is deserving of paying restitution for their stealing, but that's not a, a crime that's worthy of the death penalty. So if they're simply coming to steal, you would let them steal, get away, and then you would handle that in court by way of restitution is the idea here. Uh, it's not if that person broke in in daytime and was trying to kill you and you killed him back, well, guess what? Because the sun was out, now you're a murderer. That's not the point that's being trying to be made there. You have a question? What if he's uh, visible at night? Like, you, you can see him or whatever he's under, like, what do you do? Yeah, so I think the principle actually has really nothing to do with day or night. It's the principle of uh, are you able to tell what they're doing? So, for example, if someone is in your driveway trying to steal your car and you run out there with a shotgun and shoot them, I think you're in the wrong. Yet a life is worth more than your car. You should... And you have every right to report them to the cops, to sue them, to seek restitution for your stolen car, completely justified. He should pay for stealing your car. But if there's no threat to human life whatsoever and you take human life in that scenario, I think you'd be in the wrong. Whereas he breaks in, he's trying to kill you or hurt you or harm someone, and you act in self-defense, that's a completely different scenario. I think that's what the law of God is fleshing out. You don't know, like... Right. I don't know if he's trying to take my TV or kill me, you know? Yeah. And so that's, that's what the difference that's been fleshed out there. All that to say, though, that's an example in the civil law of a justified use of self-defense. As well, we have an example of, of Jesus' teaching in Luke 22, verse 36. Someone read that for us. He said to them, but now let the one who has money back take it, and likewise a knapsack, and let the one who has sore sell his cloak and buy one. Yep. So basically he's telling his disciples, if you don't have a sword for this dangerous journey you're about to go on, sell your cloak and buy a sword. Well, why would he give that command if under every circumstance them using that sword was wrong? Because if you're going out and you see a guy trying to steal your car, Bring the shotgun. 
Because if he pulls up and points a weapon at you, now it's different. That's, That's completely point. different, yeah. yeah. Now it's different. Now you have a, now you threaten with your life. And you could have your life threatened. I'm, I'm sending you on this thing here. I, I, I want you to get there. Right. All right? I, you need to be able to defend yourself. Yeah. Okay? At least have the, hey, I can defend myself if I have to with this sword or right. 1911. Yeah. Well, and Jesus yeah. understood the message he was sending them with was highly offensive to right. a lot of people. Like, now, let me ask you, is it at every time appropriate to utilize this sort of self-defense? Not necessarily, because what happened when Jesus um, was about to be arrested and Peter pulls out the sword and chops off the guy ear, does Jesus tell him, keep swinging, you're about to get him? No, right? He tells him to lay it down because he's doing something far more important. He's laying down his life intentionally, right? So there's, is there a time when you wouldn't fight back strategically? Well, I think we have some examples of that. I think is there's a time to turn the our cheek for the sake of the gospel. There is times for that, right? So in, in saying that there's a biblical, biblically justified use of self-defense, does that mean that people can lay down that right strategically for the sake of the gospel? They absolutely can. You see examples of, yeah, martyrs, for example, for the faith that are laying down their lives for the sake of God's glory. That's that a completely... Um, justified thing for the Christian to do. I'm simply trying to highlight from the Bible that it's not a necessity in every situation. All right, so it's, it's okay for someone to lay down their life um, in those situations, but it's not a biblical necessity in every situation. We also see this civilly example. We saw this in the book of Nehemiah as we were studying that. Someone read for us Nehemiah chapter 4 verses 13 and 14. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall and open places, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Yeah. So in this, we, we see what was happening. They were in the process of rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem. They were at... Um, in many ways, a defenseless position. They were vulnerable, and the enemies all around them were threatening to come in and conquer them. And what does Nehemiah tell them to do? He said, pick up your weapons, and when they come, be ready to fight to defend the city. Now, why would that instruction be given if it was been wrong for them to defend the city? Right? That, that doesn't make any sense. But clearly, they're being told to be prepared to fight because defending the city would have been a just thing for them to do, all right? So it's not only personal self-defense, but also as you think of a community um, defending themselves or a nation defending themselves against an oppressive nation, um, that that would be justified. And then the quote there from Ezekiel, we don't necessarily need um, to read that, but it's an example of Ezekiel functioning in a prophetic way as a watchman over the city. Um, and that's, it has spiritual implications of what um, that verse is pointing at. But the illustration makes no sense if God was opposed to watchmen, right? Why, did, why was it right and normal and good for a watchman to be set over a city? So that the people could defend themselves if an attacker came, right? That's what, why the watchmen existed. And there's every reference in the scriptures to that being a noble task um, within the city. Now, the fifth point I want to get into here, and we're not going to spend as much time on this, but I do think it's worth pointing out here that it's not wrong. And the right, the right here might be a little strong um, language when I say the right of conquest, but I think the ability of conquest um, is maybe the better way to, to put that. I might be overstating that point. But as we see with the people of Israel, what were they called to do as they were to go into the promised land, the land of Canaan? To conquer it, right? And so at bare minimum, I think as we look at the scriptures, unless we start a, making excuses for what God clearly commanded them to do, which he clearly commanded them to go in and conquer that land and the people that were in it, for us to say dogmatically, it's wrong for a nation to expand their borders. Well, then how do we make what God called them to do right? <laughs> Because he called them to do that, right? He, he absolutely called them to do that, to act in that sort of way. Um, and thus, we have to take from that, that at least in some scenarios, at least in that one scenario, we have to say, it was right for them to do that. And I believe that we can 
take from that a principle of righteous nations may expand their borders. I don't think it's wrong for them to do so. Now, often, as we think of these sorts of conquests through history, it's just completely egotistical or self-centered or narcissistic on behalf of the leader, right? Their conquest is just an act of bloodthirst or vainglory, that sort of thing. I don't think God would honor those sorts of military pursuits. But also there's this narrative that gets spun, particularly if you take any American history course um, recently in the history books about, for example, us taking over a land where a native American tribe used to occupy, and they would say, look at you evil oppressors taking land that wasn't yours, right? That, that's the sort of language that's been given. Well, th there's two parts of that from an American history standpoint. One is land is always disputed, and that didn't start when we showed up on the continent, okay? If you ever heard of tribal warfare, they were fighting over territory forever, okay? Um, there's not this sense of like, it belonged to this one person, and then you denied them that right. They were arguing even when we showed up about who, which, where the boundaries belonged and that sort of thing. Um, that's something that has certainly happened. But as you look at a righteous nation, say going into a nation where very pagan, wicked, evil things were being practiced, and they're saying, for God's glory, we want to see those evils abolished and a more righteous society established. I don't think biblically you can argue against that sort of mentality. When it's a nation that's doing it, they're a righteous nation, and they're going, um, taking land from an unrighteous people. For example, you look at like when the settlers came in the Mayans down in Mexico, were literally slaughtering humans alive to the beating of drums and covering their city with human blood. And they're going, in God's name, we need to stop this, right? And we, we need, and I don't think it's wrong that people in the name of Christ took over and conquered that place. Why, why would that be wrong, biblically speaking? No, uh, I mean, I, the whole irony is for me is the people that occupied prior <laughs> believed in the same practice of we're going to, by force, we're going to take this property. Right. And so it's, it's a, it fits within their worldview right. for this to happen. And Sometimes I hear right. like they, they rob from the right. Judeo-Christian worldview of, oh, we can't do this, but it's like you don't have that right. justification. Right. If you look at all the scriptures, you're literally just robbing and picking and choosing a little right. spiritual buffet, why you can't do this. Right. And, you know, right. from the same the same worldview that gave you this ability to speak or speak your mind is the same worldview you're speaking. It's just a constant circle of the logical right. like Mess. Now, in looking at America's history, does that mean that we've always done things righteously? No. 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 Right? So were atrocities committed against certain tribes at different times? Yes. Absolutely. Which, no need to defend that. Don't, don't hear me doing that. As well, just one more point I'll make on that, is often we would make treaties with them and then break those trees, which is lying, okay? So I'm not justifying any of that sort of thing that happened. I'm just saying, in principle, it's not wrong for a righteous nation to expand their borders, which, guess what, is gonna entail a military pursuit. So we see, like, in, particularly in the Old Testament, like, times where God would say, like, you need to go in and conquer and leave no one left, no mm -hmm. cows, no nothing. And then, of course, you see, like, times they didn't, and, you right. know. Um, but there were commands like to wipe out nations. Now, would you say like in, in our history maybe or even just not presently, if God is not commanding us necessarily to go conquer nations, not that we can't, right? Right. But he's not, necess not in the same way he was telling the Israelites. So would you say that if we are to conquer nations in as much as possible, we should right. do so without shedding blood? I think that you should do all possible not to shed innocent blood. Right. Um, also I mean, understanding that in a fallen world and in military conflict, there will be some right. casualties yeah. of war. But That's you, different though than trying to shed innocent yeah. blood. So, yeah. Maybe for the example of the yeah. Mayans, right? Terrible, wicked, like of course we should stop this, right. right? But God didn't command them, go wipe out all the Mayans. So would you say in as much as possible, if you can, if you could present the gospel and they would turn from the Lord and there was yeah. little or no bloodshed, then that's... Oh, obviously ideal, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, but just our stand fallen world, right. it doesn't always flesh out that way. So a few more points I want to get to and hopefully help land the, the plane in this. Um, as we think about a soldier, we must understand that they are under authority. And sometimes this is where 
the military struggles can happen is what do you do when how many atrocities have been committed under the banner of I was just following orders, right? Because that, that certainly happens a lot. First is we must understand that it is natural for a soldier to have submission to his officer. Someone read for us 2 Timothy um, 2 verse 4. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. So in that, that verse, it says, a soldier's aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Is it saying in that illustration that that's a bad thing or an unnatural thing? No, it's making a reference to it almost as if, like, obviously, we know this to be true. And that's a normal good thing. Wars and militaries don't work without chains of command, right? It's just impossible. Someone has to be in charge. And if there's, you know, everyone trying to do it what, the way they think it ought to be done, you're going to be unsuccessful, all right? So we have to understand there is a natural authority at play that's just unavoidable as we think about a military scenario. But we also must remember that as a Christian soldier, you also have a duty um, unto God. So someone read for us Romans um, 13.1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So every human authority is ultimately under what authority? God's, right? And so if, if as much as a human authority is trumping um, what God's authority is, then who should the soldier submit to? In other words, if a soldier who rightly takes orders, that's a normal, natural thing for the soldier to do, is commanded to do something that's contrary to what God has told him to do, who should he take orders from? God, God right? So, so a soldier must be under authority. That will imply human authority, but that doesn't give them a pass to break God's law, okay? When God tells us to do something, we, can't, we, we don't get the freedom as Christians to say, I was just following orders as we do sinful things, okay? Now, hold, hold on with me for a second, because this, this does get a little tricky. Um, as we think of the soldier's ethic, a few final points, and then um, if you guys have any questions, we can talk about those. A Christian must do all things to God's glory. Soldiers are not exempted from that, all right? No matter what they're doing, they should be doing it for God's glory. As well, Christians must act in accordance with God's law. God's law is ultimately the standard um, that ought to govern our conscience. But third, and lastly, I, I want to say, we must seek to discern the morality of a cause as we seek to do it. Someone read for us Proverbs 1, um, verses 10 through 19. And then someone else be flipping over at James 4 and be ready for that one. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood, let us ambush the innocent without reason. Like Sheol, let us swallow them alive. And whole, like those who go down to the pit, we shall find all precious goods, we shall fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot with us, we will all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them, hold back your foot from their paths. Their feet run to evil and will make haste to shed blood. 319. For in vain is a net spread in the sight of any bird. But these men lie in wait for their own blood. They set in ambush for their own lives. Such are the ways of everyone who is greedy for unjust gain. It takes away the life of possessors. They ask you, have militaries ever been used to do that sort of thing? Yeah. And what's the wisdom of Proverbs? Don't, don't run with those kind of people, right? If, it, if it's a wicked army that's d just perpetuating evil and, and hurting innocent people, you shouldn't be running with that type of crowd, right? That's what it's saying. It, that's going to bring great harm to you. Someone read for us James 4:17. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Yep. I think that that's probably the key verse I want to end with on this. When you know the right thing to do and you don't do it, to that person it's sin. 
Let me ask you, is soldiers gonna sometimes be given orders from their officers and they need to act immediately and they don't have all the information in front of them. They're not the judge and jury. They don't know exactly, you know, if they're pulling out their just war theory books and able to decide, is this the conflict that I can go into as a Christian? They, they don't always have that freedom, do they? That's not always the way that military endeavors work. Sometimes you're called, you need to go here, you need to go now, this is the enemy, this is what you need to do. And that soldier, I don't believe is wrong as a Christian to follow his officers in that. It's natural, a soldier seeks to please the, the one that enlisted him. That's what the Bible says, that's not wrong. That's a different scenario than when you know the thing they're asking you to do is sinful and you go and do it anyways. So I, I say that to say wars are messy, Military life can be messy, and I don't think God would judge a soldier who is serving in an army that maybe this offensive they did was not morally justified, but the war was, and like they're trying to do all these equations on, on the spot. They're, they're not always able to do that, and I don't think God necessarily holds them to that sort of particular standard. But that's different than over and over again for months on end, flipping on the lights in the gas chamber and just saying, well, I was just following orders, right? Like, no, like you are a Christian. You know what God's word says. You know the dignity of human life. You don't get off that easy, right? And so I, I say that simply to say, there will be times maybe where in hindsight, a soldier goes, I don't know. Like, was that, it was everything we did justified? Was it this, was it that? And I think there's God's grace in that. You as a soldier don't always get to have the knowledge of every aspect of a situation in the moment. Um, but in as much as you know the truth, as much as you know what God's law says, and you know if you do this thing, it'll be a violation of it, you, that's where a soldier says, no, I can't do that. I have to answer to Christ um, above man, all right? And so I say all that to say, I think soldiers are put in a difficult situation. I think they should have some grace for themselves, knowing that sometimes it is their job just to obey when they don't have all the information. But if you clearly are being instructed to do something that's contrary to what God has said, your answer should be no. You have a higher master um, than the one who's over you. So that's, um, I ran through that fairly quickly. We don't have tons of time for conversation, but I do want to open it up for questions because I think there might be some. Does anyone have any questions uh, or comments? Questions, but like, no. Especially that last verse there. Uh, this whole time I'm sitting there thinking like, what, what this comes down to is, the burden of knowledge is when you know something is wrong or when you know, hey, wait a minute, there's something here. I, I, going through authority, going through, uh, I mean, the, un, the Uniform Code of Military Justice, you know, holds us to follow lawful orders, right. okay? And the burden of proof to not follow a lawful order is on you. You have to prove that it's not a lawful order. Mm -hmm. It's very, very hard. And it's also, you know, it's, I, I don't think God's going to say, you know, if you say, well, God, they were going to kill me. They were going to put me to the fire squad if I didn't do this. I, okay, well, then you don't do it. I mean, yeah. there are, I'm, I'm not saying that's, you know, a black and white thing. Right. But, you know, there's obviously grace in there, but it's also, uh, it's very, I, I, I knew this before I came in. I knew this before I enlisted. I pray for a buddy on the end of my barrel. Yeah. Okay. Right. There are things that have happened in this world that it's a fallen world. The the reason why I'm there and the reason why they're there has nothing to do with us. Yeah. You know, it has everything to do with the lies they've heard or right. you know what I have to do or whatever it is. Yeah. You know, it's not. It, I pray that everybody else in my position understands this more than anybody. Yeah. I, I've seen it where men men do not understand this before they pull the trigger. And then they're burdened with the question for their entire lives. Right. And it's 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 beyond it's right. beyond heartbreaking. It is. Because they don't they don't know the question exists, and then they pull the trigger, and then they're like, oh no, and it, it just terrifies them forever. They don't know how to ask for grace and forgiveness. I, I knew the question beforehand, and I said, look, I didn't put them there. I'm I'm just I'm just trying to follow God's orders. Okay. Right. I, you know, I I felt like He led me into the army and where He wanted me and what I'm trying to do. It's like at that point, you know, if the person that's putting me here is the person that's putting me here, that's God himself, then, mm -hmm. hey, I, I don't know how to 
argue with the judge himself. You know right. what I'm saying? So. And we're, we're finite. And that, that's why I want to highlight in this, there's a big difference between knowingly committing a sin and just being involved in a messy thing. And, and that's what war is. I mean, it, sin is, it, it, going back to that second point here, it's necessary in light of the fall, right? The whole reason we're having any of these equations is because we live in a fallen world. Um, this is not something that happens in a world without sin. And so just embracing that and doing what we know to do to the best we can and being able to sleep at night because of that, and just th these are messy situations. And I don't think a soldier should feel guilty for killing people in a firefight. That's what they're called to do, right? I think it just like, yeah. even just further points to like, just being in God's word, yeah. like continually knowing your Bible. It's like, you, okay, you might not know every civil code from Exodus and Leviticus, right? right. Like, is this a, like you said, you don't have time to always go open up your books or whatever before you go. Yeah. But you can say like, okay, we're gonna go in, we're gonna conquer this town, whatever, okay, good, right? We feel like we're doing this. And any child we encounter, we're gonna torture them. Yeah. Well, no, I know that's not right, right? Like, right. you know. And, like, and do those things happen in war? They absolutely happen in war. Yeah. And so that's where the, the Christian that's has to be different like, as a soldier. Yeah. You just do. But just knowing your Bible, like it's yeah. if you don't know every situation, but. Philippians, hey, what's your view or principle behind like, uh, you're not the one pulling the trigger, but you're supporting the people who pull the trigger. So you don't get to pull the trigger, but you're supporting, logistically supporting the people pulling the trigger. What's, uh, what's your view on that? Yeah, so as, as a citizen, I will say that I'm very supportive of our civil magistrate because I believe they've been ordained by God, according to Romans 13, to punish the evildoer. Um, and so for me, as a citizen, I'm, I'm not in the civil magistrate, I've not been put in that position, but I do support what they're doing because I believe it's a God-ordained role. Um, now, does that mean that I believe every military endeavor the U.S. has ever done was justified by God's law? No, I don't believe that, but I don't believe that's true of any um, political body ever. Again, we live in a fallen world, and so um, I do support um, them, and I, I pray for them. I pray that they would act in accordance with God's law, but um, I do think we have a right to support the magistrate. Um, God does not lay down principles of anarchy. Um, that's not what um, his word teaches. He teaches ordered authority. Um, and a an society ordered under his rule will be a society with, with rulers and with those who punish evil. And that's, that's partially how he's designed it to be. So um, I think... Speak against yeah. Not. yeah, and if it, the Yeah, and if our, you know... Say our government commands a wicked action, we should feel no burden to defend it. So, so we can speak honestly into that as well. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, this, it's, this hasn't come up yeah. 30 times in the last month. No. Okay, but Philippians 4 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything be, you know, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request them. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, there are things that we do not understand. Yeah. There's information that we yeah. just don't have. And it's impossible for right. any one person to know all of the information for every single context. Yeah. It's impossible. Right. God has all that. And God's and, and I believe God will God, God will look at, hey, in this part right here, this is what's bothering me. I know I knew the condition of your heart. I knew why you did this. Yeah. I knew why you felt here if it was bloodlust if it was you were just angry at the enemy then right whether it's a lawful order or not i'm gonna judge you on that right i'm gonna judge you on you just hated those other people and you didn't even know them i love them too right. and you hated them and i know men that i've served with that felt that way but also no men on the other side yeah. i don't hate anybody right okay i don't like bullets all right sorry Captain yeah. i love it it's a great yeah. one right? <laughs> but it's Peace in God surpasses all yeah. understanding. Yeah. For a lot of people, I pray for that peace. Yeah. And it's, they're just not going to understand. But that's that's where they lock you. Don't be anxious about anything. All right? So, you know. Yeah. Let me pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time, for the study we've had this morning. Lord, I do pray that you would grant um, peace. Um, particularly to those um, members of our body who have served and had to do things that they would never want to do, desire to do, had to see things that they would never want to see or experience. 
Um, but they stepped up to the call in order to serve, in order to love you and your people. Um, and we are the recipients of those sacrifices, those painful encounters that so many um, have encountered on our behalf. And so Lord, I pray we'd be grateful for that. And Lord, I do pray for those at the top of our military, those who are making these sorts of decisions. Um, I, Lord, I pray that you'd help them to be um, righteous in the way that they lead um, those institutions. And Lord, I, I just pray against um, the unrighteousness that exists in a lot of it and pray specifically against even just some of the wickedness of recent actions of those in charge of the military, whether it be um, with the promotion of the LGBTQ stuff and flying rainbow flags over bases and just some of the horrid aspects of that, those that are promoting the draft for women and, and just various things that are dishonoring to you, Lord. I pray against that um, in our country. Uh, but Lord, in that, I pray that as we look at those wrong actions that we don't lose our respect and our honor for those who have fought nobly um, for things that are righteous. And so Lord, would you help us to be wise in these things? And Lord, I pray for our soldiers that you'd help them to navigate the, these waters in real time, um, that you'd help them to ultimately serve Christ above all human authority. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. He said.